thanks everyone for coming. Uh, hope you're having a good conference. I know I'm having a ton of fun over at the Rapids booth up on the sixth floor. Um, so I'm Keith Krauss. I'm one of the maintainers of Rapids. I'm a engineering manager at NVIDIA. Um, I work most heavily on our QDF library, which I'll talk about later. Uh, but we're really excited about kind of accelerating the data science ecosystem and the PyData ecosystem using GPUs. And so kind of one, of one of the reasons we kind of looked at this ecosystem and thought, hey, we can kind of take advantage of GPUs and parallel compute hardware is kind of we looked at the history of kind of how people have been doing data processing. And so if we go back, say, like 10 years from now, everyone kind of at scale was using Hadoop. And it looked something like this, where everything was on disk. You would read from disk, do some type of query, write to disk, read back from disk, do some slicing and dicing of your data, write to disk, read from disk again, and then do some type of training or modeling or other type of work. And then Spark came around and kind of most people that cared about performance moved over to Spark. And the big thing was, hey, Spark is primarily in memory. It was kind of 25 to 100x improvements, less code. Everything was kind of easier and faster for you. Um, and now fast forward 10 years today, and we're kind of at this point where we're starting to see the bottlenecks that come up in kind of just the CPU-based in-memory computing. And that basically this is a really simple query of just a like group by count. Um, and you can see here that basically once the data is in memory in the nice in memory format, just doing something simple like that will actually just completely bottleneck at the CPU. And this is kind of after your data has been parsed, after you do all of the kind of nasty cleaning of your data and other things before you actually run this type of analytical query. And those are a lot more complicated, typically, and more CPU intensive than these. And so that bottleneck gets even worse as your, comp as your workload becomes more complex. And so kind of if you look at deep learning and other fields, people started to look at, hey, GPUs have lots of compute power. Maybe I can use them to accelerate these types of workloads. And it ended up looking something like this, where you, your data still lives in the data lake or wherever it sits in a DBMS or something. You have kind of a one-time expensive read, and then you move it over to the GPU, and all of a sudden you can do that work a lot faster. But then you end up writing it back to system memory in order to kind of go hand it off to your next tool. And so, for example, in the GPU world, you could imagine that, oh, I've got some kind of like GPU database and I run a query, that query returns really fast, but then I send the data back to system memory either as like a pandas data frame or a numpy array, only for then another application to read in that data, copy it back to the GPU in basically the same format that it started on, do its work and repeat the same process. And basically what you see is, yeah, you get like a five to 10x improvement there, but it ends up being way more code, way more complex, way more rigid, and you're losing most of your performance from those kind of intermediate steps in just doing unnecessary copies and conversions of data. Um, but a lot of people ask, like, so why, why would I use GPUs? Like, why, why do GPUs make sense for data science and data analytics? And it comes down to a few different hardware advantages. So kind of when people hear of GPUs, most people think of, like, oh, I'm going to be doing big, dense matrix multiplies. Um, GPUs are actually very general purpose compute accelerators. They've essentially just got thousands of cores. So like modern high-end GPUs, you can get up to 15 teraflops of kind of general purpose compute performance, and then another 10, 20x that for like deep learning specific performance. Uh, but then on top of that, you've got up to a terabyte a second of memory bandwidth per GPU, hardware interconnects that go up to like 300 gigabytes a second of bi-directional GPU to GPU bandwidth. And then you can actually just scale up to like 16 GPUs in a single node, as opposed to having to scale out uh, when you want more sockets. Um, and kind of one, of one of the key takeaways here is I talked about kind of a terabyte a second of memory bandwidth. The 15 teraflops actually is just like infinitely more than that memory bandwidth, where you essentially almost never run out of compute relative to your memory bandwidth. Um, and so what that means is that you essentially, you end up at this new kind of programming mindset where you're not optimizing to do the compute in the smartest and most efficient way possible. You optimize to minimize your data movement and minimize your memory copies because those end up being your most expensive thing. And so kind of going back to 
the original diagram, this is what it would look like to use kind of two GPU accelerated applications, application A and B. The, the fastest way to optimize this isn't to optimize the compute that A and B are doing. It's to eliminate everything in the middle here, which ends up like entirely becoming your bottleneck and you spend more than half the time just in those copy and conversions. And so kind of as, as Rapids was starting and before Rapids, there was the GPU Open Analytics Initiative, Apache Arrow was growing at the same time. And so Apache Arrow is a really, really exciting open source project that a combination of the Pi Data ecosystem, the Apache Big Data ecosystem are kind of standardizing around to define standard memory layouts to allow different technologies, different programming languages to efficiently share memory between them and then to eventually run efficient compute on top of it. And one of the things that they basically really were trying to solve is, hey, I don't want to have to constantly serialize and deserialize my data and convert things to move kind of between different stages in a data pipeline. Um, and so kind of learning from Apache Arrow, Rapids builds entirely on top of Apache Arrow with the idea of sharing GPU memory between different technologies. And so you can see here that essentially you go from those constant CPU writes, CPU writes, CPU reads, CPU read, to you do a one-time read to get data into GPU memory, and then you can essentially just go through your whole pipeline and just share the GPU memory across that pipeline. And kind of once, once you do that and you have that working, you see some like amazing real-world benefits. And so this is, this is like a real-world, uh, a real world workflow of essentially modifying, uh, God, sorry, excuse me, modeling credit risk. Basically, is someone going to default on their mortgage? And it basically involves loading a bunch of kind of gross CSV data, doing some slicing and dicing, feature engineering on the data, and then essentially training an XGBoost model to say, hey, is this person going to default or not? And basically, you can see here that with a single DGX2, which is a 16 GPU box, or five, eight GPU boxes, we can get massive, massive, massive speed ups on the end-to-end -end data pipeline by doing it all on the GPU. And kind of just to put in perspective, um, Rapids, we're at, uh, we just released 0 0.10 a few weeks ago. Uh, we'll be releasing 0 0.11 in mid-December. It's just over a year old at this point. It launched back in October of 2018. And it's improving over time still. That you can see that we're still, over the past year, we've gotten basically another 50x, or sorry, 50% 50 performance. Um, there's still a lot of room for optimization. There's a lot more room to make this faster. So we're really excited uh, by the potential of this ecosystem. And just to kind of share um, from Francois Chalette, uh, one of the Keras, he very involved in Keras and TensorFlow, Basically, what he was saying is that the people who win at data science are those who basically have the most iteration cycles. That essentially it's a combination of speed and user experience in order for the developers and data scientists to just get as much iteration with their data as possible in order to build the best results. So we're here talking about Rapids. And kind of before we get into Rapids, uh, this is, this is PyData, we're talking about the PyData ecosystem. And so this is a super high level picture of what the PyData ecosystem will look like. That in general, you have some type of pipeline that looks like data preparation, which includes things like loading data, some ETL, some feature engineering, into then some modeling, into some visualization, and then you have a feedback loop in there that basically everyone goes through this type of loop of, hey, I've got data, I wanna draw insights from it. This is the pattern of how people draw insights. And then people use libraries like Pandas, Scikit-learn, NetworkX, your deep learning framework of choice, uh, Matplotlib, Seaborn, Bokeh, et cetera. Now, kind of what we're doing with Rapids is basically trying to enable users of this PyData ecosystem to be able to take advantage of GPU acceleration and accelerated hardware without having to completely rethink how they work, without having to learn lower level programming. That basically, um, QDF essentially is a pandas-like library. QML is a scikit-learn-like library. QGraph follows the NetworkX API and is graph analytics library. And then of course there's GPU accelerated deep learning frameworks 
um, and you can continue to use your data visualization framework of choice. But so kind of this talk is about how do we scale for like high performance data science at scale. And we, we actually scale using Dask. And so kind of for those of you who aren't familiar with Dask, Dask is a distributed Python task graph framework and kind of distributed compute engine. And what's really great about it is it's PyData native. Um, so I know Eric Dill gave a talk yesterday about a combina like basically Spark, Dask, Rapids, et cetera. Um, Dask, from a Python perspective, Dask just like very naturally plugs into this ecosystem that I can continue to write kind of my high level Python and very naturally um, just describe what I want to accomplish as a set of tasks. Um, for GPUs and for the Rapids ecosystem, Dask is great because it's extremely modular in that, for example, Dask data frame use, used Pandas data frames underneath as its compute layer. Um, because we followed the Pandas API, it was really easy for us to say, hey, let's, have, let's work with the Dask community to have them target Pandas-like APIs that anyone who basically follows the Pandas API enough can plug in as a compute layer underneath Dask data frame. And then all of a sudden, hey, you've got GPU accelerated Dask data frames at that point. Um, also, the fact that it is Python native as opposed to, for example, something like Spark that has the JVM in the middle, it makes it really easy to get uh, to access things like C++, C, and CUDA related code, um, which gives us a lot of flexibility to give kind of you as end users of data scientists, data engineers, and developers the most powerful tools for you to solve your problems. Um, and one of the things that we're really excited that we're kind of working with the DAS community to contribute is basically the ability to use lower level transport mechanisms than TCP. So there's this great open source library called OpenUCX. Uh, it's a community-driven effort between NVIDIA, AMD, Mellanox, ARM, IBM, a few different national labs, a few different universities. But the idea is basically building a communication abstraction library that can take advantage of any hardware fast paths, fast paths available on systems. And so for Dask, what this means is that if I'm working with GPU memory all of a sudden I could take advantage of hardware interconnects between GPUs and get 150 gigabytes a second between GPUs within a node. Or, hey, say, say I've just got like some gaming GPUs and I don't have hardware interconnects. I still have the PCI Express bus that I can copy things over without having to go back to the CPU to go back to the GPU. And there I can still get like 16 gigabytes a second, give or take. Um, and then say, oh, I've got like a big cluster and I've got the money for like really powerful networking for that cluster. We can take advantage of things like InfiniBand and RDMA over Ethernet to kind of get peak throughput. And what's, what's really exciting is that even if you have no specialized hardware whatsoever, you need to send over a one gigabit Ethernet link, it will have a TCP fallback, but all of the memory management and TCP handling is moved underneath the Python layer, and so we can still provide speed ups there as well and it will work for CPU memory as well as GPU memory. So basically for, for anyone using Dask with anything like Pandas data frames, NumPy arrays, this is really exciting because it's gonna make the communication a lot faster. And for GPUs, we're super excited because it'll make the communication like 100x faster than TCP. And so kind of the high level picture is that, you know, PyData, super productive APIs, super friendly user experience for people. People are super productive with it. If you need to scale up using PyData, use Rapids. And then when you need to scale out, you can use Dask and Rapids with Dask in order to scale out. And basically the whole idea here is everything in this kind of ecosystem basically has the same APIs and same end user experience where you write the same high level code that you're used to writing to solve your problems as opposed to worrying about distributed systems problems or how do I target this specific parallel hardware. So let's dive into some of the libraries. Uh, so the first one, let's talk about QDF, which is our GPU accelerated data frame library. And so when we were first building this, uh, a lot of people basically asked like, do we really need GPU accelerated ETL? Like, do people care about that? And 
The answer is yes, that the average data scientist spends like 90 plus percent of their time in just dealing with their data and slicing and dicing their data and cleaning their data and doing feature engineering as opposed to training models. And kind of, uh, one, of one of our designers actually threw this together that basically with CPUs, it's very common that people essentially kick off a job, go grab a cup of coffee, hope for the best, come back to see, oh, I forgot to add a feature or something broke, make a small change, kick off another job, go grab some more coffee. Um, and kind of where, where we're trying to go with GPUs is to basically what you're running, like what you're running today in batch, we want to move to be interactive. That, you know, if things are going to blow up, let's blow up fast so that you can immediately iterate and fix things. And as much as maybe data scientists won't be happy about it, let's try to curb the caffeine addiction. So kind of this is, this is what the technology stack of QDF looks like. So there is a Python high-level API, looks and feels like pandas. Uh, very quickly underneath there, there is a Cython layer to basically bind to C++ APIs. Um, there is a full C++ library that you can use directly if you'd like, if you want to go lower than the Python. Um, and then underneath that C++ library, it basically builds on top of the years of software investment um, in the CUDA and NVIDIA ecosystem. So libraries like Thrust, Cub, Jetify, et cetera, to basically take full advantage of the hardware available. And so libqdf, I said, is basically the CUDA C++ library. This contains all of the guts of the implementation. So everything as far as doing all of like the element-wise math, things like sorting, joins, group buys, reductions, basically anything that you could think of as being like compute heavy or expensive lives in libqdf. And again, there is a full featured C++ API if you'd want to use that directly. Then qdf is the Python library on top of that, that basically exposes the pandas API that user, most end users kind of expect and want to work with. And it basically integrates nicely into the PyData ecosystem where you can kind of hand it the typical things that you would hand, like NumPy arrays, any kind of like Python editable, et cetera. Um, it, and then we also do some kind of fun things with uh, just-in-time compiling user-defined functions so that your apply functions that normally uh, slow down quite a bit in Pandas are no longer very painful. And I'll pull up a Jupyter Notebook and we'll play around with that in a little bit. And so just some, just some like quick, easy benchmarks. Uh, this is on a easy benchmark, five, five columns of in 32 data, uh, 10 million rows and 100 million rows. And you can see that QDF, we get some really huge speed ups over Pandas. And that kind of merge like a join, sorting, group by, um, depending on the operation, we can get more speed up. Uh, it's very, it's very operation dependent, but you'll typically see in like the worst case, we get about a 10 X and in the best case, it's like more than a thousand X. But you know, not, uh, not everything is data frames. Um, so we have a full string library as well on the GPU. And so this kind of exposes the things that you would typically think of doing, and especially when you get into kind of the gross ETL land of having to deal with all kinds of weird string data. So we've got a regular expression engine, all of your typical element-wise operations. You can run group buys and joins on strings. Um, there's full categorical columns with both the values and categories on the GPU um, that essentially, instead of relying on Python objects, we have a native string type within QDF. And they're, it's, it's pretty fast. Um, kind of coming, coming in future releases, we're actually optimizing strings further that it was originally built as a side library to QDF. It's moving into QDF and becoming more natively built into QDF and libqdf. Um, and kind of with that, we're also exploring, hey, how could we do just-in-time compiled string UDFs, which is a very tricky problem. Um, and kind of, Something, something I think is amazing and what really made me think, wow, Rapids is real, is um, we have a set of GPU accelerated readers and writers. And so you can see kind of basic code snippet on the right here, we have a GPU accelerated CSV reader and it'll typically get like 15 to 25 X over Pandas. Um, and depending, depending on exactly your types, if you rely on type inference or not, that number can vary quite a bit. Uh, but we also have a parquet reader, an orc reader, 
JSON reader, Avro reader. Uh, we have a CSV writer. We have an ORC writer as of 0 0.10, and a Parquet writer will be coming in the next release as well. Um, and kind of one, one of the keys here in order for us to kind of drive these speed ups is handling as much on the GPU as possible. So if you essentially give us a compressed file, we will actually just send those compressed bytes to the GPU, do decompression on the GPU, do all of the parsing on the GPU, and then return you data frame on the GPU. And basically, because we do everything on the GPU, it saves us the bandwidth in getting data to the GPU. And then basically, we don't get CPU bottlenecked in just trying to load data, which actually, uh, as you can see, can be a pretty big bottleneck in a lot of situations. Um, and there is a, there's an announced but not yet released technology called GPU Direct Storage that is really exciting that will basically allow you to bypass the CPU entirely for loading data and basically just go over, uh, basically talk to NVMe drives either locally or over a fabric and get even more bandwidth to the GPU that way. So as of now, it needs to go through the CPU? As of now, basically, so like say you ran this code, what it's going to do is run a memmap under the hood and then copy those bytes to the GPU. Um, in general, because it lives on a, say it lives just on a local disk, there, no matter what, you have to read the data into memory first to send it to the GPU somewhere. Um, with NVMe, because NVMe's live on the PCI Express bus with GPUs, uh, we can actually kind of be smarter and figure out, oh, here's the like essentially address range on the NM that NVMe that we want to read the memory from and just copy it over the PCI Express bus to the GPU without ever having to go back to the CPU and back down. But is that time with that technology? No, this is, this is without the technology. And so there'll be even more speed ups when we integrate that. Is any of that OSOS intended? Uh, so Rapids in general only runs on Linux as of now. Um, but other than that, there, it's not like distro dependent or anything like that. Obviously, if you have if you have like a crowded PCI Express topology, then you'll have less bandwidth, and that will affect things. But it, in general, you typically see this like 10, 15x, 25x type speed up for CSV. Um, I would also uh, I haven't done any benchmarking myself, but I've also heard that the Orc writer is amazing, and that someone was saying that they got like a 50x over Spark's Orc writer. So I'd say check that out too. Um, the team that works on these, this kind of like I/O reading, writing stuff is amazing. They're they're crazy, and this is this is really what sold me. Like, okay, if they can parse CSVs on GPU, they can probably do most things on the GPU because that is not something that you would think of as like a traditional GPU type problem. So, um, but yeah, ETL ETL isn't just data frames, and so kind of PyData ecosystem people use NumPy arrays all over. And NumPy is kind of like the standard for, hey, here's how I interact with array data. Um, in GPU land, that's a little bit more complicated of a story because there isn't just one NumPy library. There's actually about 15 different GPU Python array libraries. And there isn't like one winner by any means. And so we've been doing a lot of work to essentially just build bridges in this ecosystem to allow all of these different GPU accelerated libraries to just share memory between one another, zero copy. And so what that means for you as a user is you can essentially combine all of these libraries together and just chain function calls from all of these libraries. And literally, it's just pointer sharing to basically handle GPU memory under the hood. And so, for example, I, do, I load some data using QDF. I do some slicing and dicing of my data. I can then hand that to something like PyTorch zero copy and immediately inference or train on it and basically save a ton of time and memory by doing that. Um, so the other thing, like, so we talked about NumPy. Uh, there is, there's GPU accelerated li array libraries. I'm using CuPy here as an example because they most closely follow the NumPy or, uh, API. But CuPy can basically drive huge speed up similar to QDF for array type things. And so this is kind of some simple benchmarks, things like FFTs, array slicing, matrix multiplication. Um, that you can get big speed ups there as well. And then for things like SVDs, you can see that basically, excuse me, scaling, going from essentially all of the CPUs in a big box. This is like a dual 20, a dual 20 core box. Um, a single GPU, you'll get like a, typically like a 2x over a dual 20 core, and then it will scale 
up to uh, like eight or more GPUs. And we'll do, we'll do some examples of doing SVD in a little while in a notebook. Um, and just like kind of a fun thing, for example, uh, generating, generating random data and then actually running like an aggregation across that data that basically using 80 GPUs, you can do 3.2 petabytes of data in less than an hour, for example. And the, the key thing here is this is all working in high-level Python APIs without any CUDA magic, ninja, wizardry, anything, that you write the same NumPy-like APIs and basically combination of like Dask, CuPy, take advantage of the hardware uh, transparently to you as an end user. And just some other videos that you can see kind of some of how, how Rapids uses Dask to scale up and scale out. Uh, I would definitely say watch them. They're quick little things, but they're really cool. Uh, so we talked, about, we talked about machine learning as well, that people use sklearn, PyData ecosystem. We have an open source library called QML, which is basically follows the scikit-learn API. And kind of the problem is that basically what we see is people, people want to train models to drive insights of their data, but they end up with just more and more data where their modeling techniques can't handle it. And so then they end up in this place where they do sampling, they try to remove outliers, they do dimensionality reduction, feature selection. Um, essentially, they, they just use more and more techniques to try to reduce the amount of data that they're dealing with um, in order to actually be able to run their, mod their modeling uh, in a timely fashion to actually drive valuable insights. Um, so Kumel looks kind of similar to, looks similar to QDF that basically Python, Cython, full-featured C++ library. I do want to point out that we, there is something called QML prims, which is essentially a set of math primitives used for building machine learning algorithms. And so it will, it'll have things like distance functions um, and kind of other like linear algebra type primitives that are very commonly used in building these machine learning algorithms. And we expose those primitives where, hey, if there's like something you want to do different than like that's not just like a normal straightforward algorithm, you don't need to reinvent all of that low level complicated math and like doing that on the GPU isn't necessarily trivial. You can essentially just compose your algorithm of these primitives and get really, really good performance from doing so. And so kind of just high level picture of what uh, QML looks like today. Uh, we have a bunch of algorithms so far in 0.10. Uh, things like uh, we recently released random forest and we have a multi-node, multi-GPU random forest implementation that we're really excited about. Uh, definitely go try it out. But things like clustering, uh, k-means, db scan, umap, et cetera. Um, it's really, really, really exciting that basically if, if you use these algorithms via scikit-learn today, and I would, I would really encourage you, go check it out, try it, let us know how it works. Um, and just to kind of give an example, what it looks like to kind of run something like this on the CPU that you import uh, from scikit-learn, you import something, uh, import dbscan, and then you run like fit and predict. And then to do it, with Kumel and QDF, it's literally just an import change at that point. And it runs the exact same way. It will handle GPU inputs. It will handle like your typical NumPy array and CPU-based inputs as well. And you can see, again, we get some pretty great speed ups over scikit-learn um, and that we, we stop at 4 million rows and like 64K array size that if we get any larger, it just it becomes really, really difficult to benchmark because scikit-learn starts taking a long time. Um, but we're, we're, really, we're really, really excited. So, um, and we also have a forest inferencing library where if you're using something like XGBoost or LightGBM or like scikit-learn RF, um, basically we have this inferencing library where you can feed it any of these trained models. It has a super lightweight, easy to use Python API that basically can give you a like 20 to 35 X speed up in your inferencing. Um, and so kind of this is, this is what it looks like today uh, as of our latest release in October. Um, so we have, we have some multi-node, multi-GPU algorithms. We have a few multi-GPU algorithms. We have a lot of single GPU algorithms. 
uh, and kind of where we're trying to we're trying to be by March of 2020 uh, for a 0 0.13 release is be here uh, that kind of all multi, a bunch of multi-node, multi-GPU algorithms. Uh, so I mentioned we have a graph analytics library as well. And kind of what some of the goals, benefits, uh, really, really high performance. And so for example, we say up to 500 million edges here on a single GPU. That it's really like up to 2 billion edges, give or take. Um, we want to expose a uh, property graph support via kind of QDF data frames. So basically you can hand data frames in, get data frames out and run like a query, like graph query, like things against it. Um, and that basically same principle of a really high level Python API that will follow network X, but then a full C++ API that exposes more granular things if you wish to use it as an end user. And kind of similar, uh, similar technology stack again, though I will say that there, there was already a few really great GPU accelerated graph analytics frameworks, uh, but the, the big struggle was that they didn't solve the data pipeline problem where essentially you as an end user needed to go and construct uh, like compressed C++ objects in order to use them, which is essentially like a non-starter for most data scientists, data engineers. And so we pipeline all of that for you, handle all of that on the GPU where basically you can focus on just using high level algorithms to solve your problems. And you can see here, we've got a bunch of graph algorithms as well. Um, we recently released a blog on multi GPU page rank about running uh, page rank on, I think 300 gigabytes of data and it running in, I think like 20 seconds or so. Uh, I would seriously say, check it out. I know before Nvidia, I was at a cybersecurity lab where Running, running, being able to run page rank on a large amount of data very fast was the dream to build essentially a time series of graph features to then feed into kind of more traditional ML and DL. And so the fact that kind of we can actually do that at scale now is super, super exciting. Uh, and you can see here, um, not, not the best benchmark because it's network X, which um, definitely trades performance for ease of use. But you can see we get basically huge speed ups even on some of these smaller graphs that are only like a few hundred thousand nodes and edges. And kind of, uh, like I said, we released a blog of this recently, but essentially uh, 16 billion edges, 400 million vertices um, that we essentially were able to do it in I think under a minute, essentially for running page, uh, page rank. And so kind of this is, this is what it looks like today that we've got a bunch of single GPU algorithms. PageRank is the first multi-GPU algorithm that we've released for Graph. Um, and kind of where, where we're shooting to go by March, uh, have a personal PageRank multi-node multi-GPU, have a breadth first search multi-node multi-GPU, and have some additional single GPU algorithms. Uh, we also have a recently, re uh, recently released open source geospatial library. Um, it's, definitely, it's definitely earlier. Uh, we're seeing like huge performance uh, improvements that it's getting like a thousand X over like GDAL, which is kind of one of the reference geospatial libraries. Um, we're still very much figuring out what the Python API should look like for this. So it's still a little bit early. Um, if you're interested in geospatial analysis, please give it a shot, raise an issue, tell us that this API makes no sense. You should follow this API or consider this. We really, really love feedback to help kind of drive what this should look like for us. But basically, as it, as it stands today, there is a, there's a, C, a full C++ library API. There's a Python API on top of that. Um, and it integrates nicely into the rest of the Rapids libraries, where basically you can hand it QDF data frames, immediately run some type of geospatial analysis, like point and polygon, get a QDF data frame back, and continue on with your analysis. And data never needs to leave the GPU. Um, so yeah, and so kind of like where, where we are today, um, we've got like point and polygon, a few different distance calculations like Haversine distance, Hausdorff distance, uh, Latlon transformations, et cetera. And kind of where we're going is kind of a lot, a lot more of kind of different geospatial indexing techniques, uh, kind of different geospatial clustering type things. But again, 
any feedback that you have as users into kind of what geospatial problems you're struggling to solve today that you would love some more horsepower to solve would be super helpful for us to kind of define what this development roadmap should look like. And so just some like really brief, uh, some really brief performance numbers um, that basically like point in polygon, uh, we can see here we get like a 300, a 300x over a optimized C++ implementation. And that if we use like the Python Shapely library, I, I don't even know, it one millisecond to 130,000 milliseconds, it's, yeah. Um, and then for things like distance calculations, again, we get huge speed ups as well. Um, so I want to make it clear, like Rapids, NVIDIA contributes heavily to Rapids. We really believe in building this open source GPU ecosystem, but NVIDIA is by no means the like, sole contributor to Rapids. That there is a number of contributors across companies like Anaconda, Blazing SQL, uh, Preferred Networks, who does Chainer and Kupai, UC Davis for Gunrock, Quonsight, Walmart, um, and that a bunch of people are using it already as well. And kind of we, we work with a lot of open source communities as well uh, to kind of help drive both the Rapids ecosystem and the general PyData ecosystem and make sure that we're aligned in how we move forward. Um, and so kind of along with the like core Rapids libraries, there's people building on top of Rapids now. And kind of just to highlight a few, Streams is a, it's a Python stream processing uh, framework that it was originally built for using Pandas and Dask to do stream processing. Uh, but because we follow Pandas API, we've done a little bit of work to make it more general purpose. And so it can target QDF as well. And we're really excited to kind of continue driving stream processing through there. Um, Nucleo is a serverless, it's like a serverless event platform. And basically they've, they're utilizing Rapids to kind of GPU accelerate data processing under it where typically they would CPU bottleneck in using either Pandas or Spark, um, and that with GPUs, they can actually just basically get like NIC line rate at that point. And one of the ones I'm really excited about is Blazing SQL, which is essentially an open source SQL engine that uses the same libqdf C++ library as the QDF Pandas-like library. And so basically the idea is that you get to just write SQL and their inputs and outputs are things like QDF or DAS QDF data frames. And so it just naturally plugs into your data pipeline entirely. Um, and they actually just recently released a blog where they, were, they ran a few of the TPCH uh, scale factor 100 queries and their results are very, very good where the majority of the time, uh, oh, sorry, not the majority, but a non-trivial amount of time is actually just loading data from cloud storage or local NVMe drives which is a pretty good place to bottleneck, considering. And kind of just to give you an example of what it looks like, it's a kind of, it's just a Python library that kind of plugs in naturally into the PyData ecosystem that essentially you just point it to, point it to your data, whether that's local or in some type of cloud store, and then run SQL, and then calling .get returns a QDF data frame at that point. And then you can proceed to use any other library that integrates in this ecosystem from there. Um, and kind of as I mentioned earlier, with uh, Nucleo building on top of it, basically enabling serverless type functionality with GPUs as well. Um, and so Rapids is kind of everywhere at this point. It's, it's crazy, uh, it's crazy from my perspective, but uh, it's in essentially all of the major clouds at this point, Google, Amazon, Azure, Alibaba, Baidu, et cetera that basically wherever you run your data analysis today, Rapids is essentially there. And if it's not, let us know and we will try to work to get it there for you. Um, and so Rapids, it's all open source. It's all on GitHub, github.com, Rapids AI. We publish Conda packages that you can just go Conda install any of these libraries. Um, and then we also publish Docker, image, Docker images both on Docker Hub and NGC. And if you go to the Rapids AI website, excuse me, there is a really easy kind of installation thing where you can basically say, hey, I want Conda or I want Docker or I want to do from source. What packages do I want? What Python version? What CUDA version? And it will basically generate you the command to install. Very nice and tidy. Um, so yeah, go, go check out the GitHub 
Uh, everything, everything is open source. We also have, uh, we have a few different repos of kind of notebooks and community notebooks and tutorials that are really helpful as far as getting started. Um, if you're familiar with the PyData ecosystem, it'll feel really boring because it just looks and feels like the libraries that you're used to using, except everything just returns faster. So um, if you want to check out, uh, we have some like 10-minute getting started guides and the API docs at stocks.rapids.ai. Uh, we also try to blog quite a bit, um, ba a combination of like, hey, what's new in the libraries that we're releasing, and like, here's some like some cool problem that someone worked on using Rapids, or like, hey, here's some cool thing that someone built on top of Rapids. Uh, check out the blog on Medium, um, and kind of I mentioned that we have we have a notebooks and a notebooks contrib repo that has examples, tutorials. Um, we even have, there's a Kaggle grandmaster on our team who kind of just goes around trying to win Kaggle competitions using Rapids, and he typically publishes all of his notebooks. Um, if you're interested in that kind of stuff, the, some of the stuff he does is wild. I would definitely check it out. It's really cool. Um, we've also started recently releasing kind of like short casts on YouTube. It's kind of like walking through what it looks like to use some of the Rapids libraries and explaining how some of the things work under the hood, uh, where it's definitely helpful. Um, this is, it's an open source community. Um, NVIDIA, obviously, we have a long history in developing GPU accelerated software. Uh, the Python open source ecosystem is definitely something that we're newer to, and we, we really need help from the community as far as driving what the direction should look like for some things. That we, we really want to help solve your problems, but we really depend on feedback from users in order to understand, hey, what algorithm or what feature should we prioritize next in order for you to solve your problems? Um, and kind of along with that, any, any type of contribution is very appreciated. Issues, feature requests, PRs, blogs, anything. Uh, we, we're, really, we're really excited about growing this community. And kind of... We, we, are one, we are one community in a larger open source data science community, and we, we do our best to work with these communities and so kind of join, join the data science movement that we work closely with the Apache Arrow project, we work, work closely with the DAS community, uh, the GP Open Analytics Initiative community, um, just any, any way that you can kind of join the community and help, it's really appreciated. And so with that, let's do some fun demo stuff. So if everyone can pray to the demo gods. The, um, all right, so just to kind of show a little bit, let's, let's see here. All right, so I, I have like typical notebook-like environment here, uh, just running in Jupyter Lab. We have a couple, we have a couple widgets um, that basically just allow us to easily track GPU memory and GPU utilization. And we're just going to do kind of some little typical things like we would normally do in Pandas. And so, for example, uh, I'm just going to use NumPy, generate some random data. Yes, I have a kernel. All right, so just generate a little bit of random data, sign that into the data frame, and I can call head on my data frame, and cool. Now, you know what? Let's do the same with a QDF data frame instead of a pandas data frame. That, okay, assign that to QDF data frame. Call head, awesome. This looks the same. Um, but, you know, and so we did this with, uh, we did this with 10 million rows here. Um, but, you know, let's, let's have a little bit of fun. Uh, instead of using NumPy, I'm going to use QPy to generate random data. And, you know, let's generate 100 million rows instead of 10 million here. So we're going to use QPy, generate 100 million rows, and then assign those into the GPU data frame here. And so basically, I'm assigning these three QPy arrays as different columns in my data frame, and then I'm deleting the reference to those original QPy arrays. Uh, and the reason I'm doing this is that essentially the QDF data frame here will actually just zero copy reference the, the memory underneath, so the same QPy array. And so when that QDF data frame goes out of scope, I want that memory to be freed and not be held by those GPU RAND objects that I created. So I create, it, create the QDF data frame, and you can see here it created in 1.1 milliseconds because I'm just zero copy sharing the memory. And so now let's, let's do some typical things that we would do for ETL. So for example, running like a join via merge. 
So you can see here, running that with pandas, uh, running 10 million rows and just joining against itself. Uh, so it'll basically roughly double the data. So you can see, OK, joining 10 million rows against itself took about five seconds. My output is about 20 million rows. And now let's run the same thing with QDF. OK, so you see we ran the join about 400 milliseconds, give or take, and it spit out 200 million rows from there. And we can do kind of some other typical things like, hey, I want to sort my data frame by that column A and run that via pandas, run it via QDF. And you can see it's basically the same high-level API. Um, we're doing 10 times the data here in QDF as we're doing with, Dan with pandas. So you can see we're still getting speed ups. And depending on the operation, we can get big speed ups, not as big of speed ups. Um, we can do we can do kind of like the typical things that you would do with math. For example, just adding two columns together, and you can see again we can 10x the data. We can still get a more than 10x in a lot of situations here. Um, this is something I'm really excited about. In that, hey, I have something that isn't like isn't the like cleanest to expose via like pandas built-ins. Let's actually use a UDF for it, and so I can define a simple function like my UDF here, and then run this via pandas apply. And this is not the most pleasant experience, because what ends up happening is this executes in Python land at this point, And it's like doing it via iteration. So, so you see it took 11 seconds there on, 10, on like 20 million rows, give or take. Um, you know what, let's do, now let's do the same thing with QDF. Um, there is a slight API difference that we're working to fix right now. Hopefully, it should be fixed in the next release. But uh, let's run this via QDF. And you can see it took 171 milliseconds. Um, what's actually happening here is we take this, we take this my UDF, we take this UDF here, and we actually pipeline it through an open source project called Numba, which is a just-in-time compiler for Python. And so what happens here is this function gets converted into vectorized GPU kernel, and then we basically just point that kernel to the data that already lives on the GPU here and just allocate an output and then assign that to the data frame. And because we've kind of, we have the ability to share memory with all of these different libraries, it makes it really streamlined in order to be able to integrate these things and combine these different things. Um, and then, you know, just to show kind of reading a CSV, so we have this, we have a CSV file here. I'm just gonna kind of show what it looks like a little bit. So you can see we have everyone's favorite data set, New York City Taxi. Um, we have the 2016 uh, month one data, and it kind of, it's, it's New York City taxi data. We can read that CSV via pandas, and then call describe on it. And you can see reading, reading CSVs, uh, if, you're, if you're interactively reading CSVs, it can kind of slow things down a little bit. Um, yep. There we go. So it took like 20, 20 seconds, give or take. And then we can read the same CSV once pandas describes. Cool. And then we can read the same CSV via QDF. And you can see 1.75 seconds. Exact same APIs that kind of you as an end user can basically use the exact same APIs, the exact same type of workflow that you're used to using, um, and just get 10x, 100x, 1000x speed ups under the hood. Uh, by taking advantage of hardware. Um, I'm going to just restart this. And, and so we talked, we talked a little bit about Dask earlier. Um, uh, I have a question Yep. No, I'm not. And like part of the problem is doing this for the CPU, it's absolutely possible, but at that like so at this point you're because of the pandas block manager, you don't necessarily know what the memory looks like here. So I could do, for example, I could do something like PDF A dot values, right? Uh, I restarted my kernel. But I could do something like PDF A dot values here. You don't know if that's gonna return by zero copy or return by copy. And if that's a big column, that's gonna be expensive. And so like your compute, your compute absolutely may be faster. 
I, I agree. The compute may be faster, but that memory copy, if that's large, will be really expensive. And so it's like, it's kind of balancing. I mean, no matter what, I'm sure it will be better than dot apply. Um, that being said, it's also, from an API perspective, it's not necessarily the most straightforward that, yeah. I mean, it's also that, for example, I need to then go through and rewrite my UDF that I can't just write a nice like scalar UDF here. I need to like go through and be like at JIT and then like instead of passing a scalar here, I need to pass an array and then put a loop inside my function so that number unrolls it and everything. Um, from an end user perspective, it's, it's definitely a little trickier. Um, there's nothing stopping a user from doing that. And I would say it's, here, I wanna just recreate a little bit here. There's nothing stopping you from doing the same on the GPU side if you want that type of control as well. That, um, for example here, so I've got, I've got my GPU data frame, I've got this series here. If I reach inside of it, I can actually get to a number device array here. And then from there, I can actually be like, oh, I want my memory pointer. And say I want to go a step further, I can even go down to, hey, here is my, here is literally the, the value of the point, like the uint pointer type on the device. So I can go feed this into a CUDA kernel or whatever else I want um, to kind of have complete and total control of whatever I'm doing so at this point. Absolutely. Like, but to a certain extent, like with Rapids, we, we've had an interesting case where we've gotten a community of GPU users where this is their first time using Python at the same time. And so people that have never used NumPy and never used Pandas have kind of come in and have been using QDF and QPy and libraries like that. And they actually really like this because they've got a whole bunch of legacy code written in like CUDA and Fortran and C that they can then easily pipeline this through. And so we, we, have, we, have like, so we have like the typical PyData data science users. We have this like new set of GPU users who have never done Python before that are trying this out, um, where essentially we want to expose everything, but this is exposed in a way where a user really needs to dig to get to it before they can like do something dangerous at the same time. So, but like kind of back to your original example of using this, someone could easily just get that number device array and run a number GPU kernel the same way as that if they wanted. Um, but the API is just, it, it becomes a lot harder to do well. And there's a lot more potential for things to crash and burn in doing so. For the implementations? Yeah. Um, in general, so we, I showed like 0 0.2 in general there hasn't really been a need to rework much. I would say that there's a major refactor happening at the C++ library right now, but from a Python and user's perspective, it's completely transparent. Um, some of the, like, sometimes we'll optimize things under the hood, but again, it's, it's like implementation details. Um, I would say most of the churn comes from that, hey, we had this API that, like, hit a subset of the Pandas API. Like for example, we only supported like two out of seven keyword arguments. And then we'll go back and add the other five keyword arguments to make it Pandas compliant and break our set. Like it'll be a breaking change from like our perspective, but in a good way, if that makes sense. And so I'd say like that's, that's where there's definitely like the biggest amount of breakage right now is just making APIs more Pandas-like, if that makes sense, so. Yeah, if, if you can't compile it, if Numba can't compile it to the GPU, it's something that you probably shouldn't run on the GPU in general, in which case then I would say your option is to essentially copy it back to the CPU and run it there. And so for example, I can do, uh, ch -ch -ch. so here I can easily do like GDFA to pandas and I've got a panda series that I can then go do whatever I want with. Oh yeah, it'll it'll basically say, "Hey, I can't compile this," and then like basically put it back onto you, saying, 
basically saying, I can't do this. It's back in your court as to what you want to do. Yeah. In, in general, we, we do our best to, if it, if it just like runs nicely, it'll run really fast. And if it's going to end up having to fall back to something really slow that doesn't make sense for the GPU, we'd rather just throw an exception that you can choose what to do, to do with. Does it what? Yes. Yeah, so it, it basically, there's, I'm sure there's definitely still edge cases because CSV is an abomination of a type that can have anything and everything in it. Um, but in general, uh, if we look here, we can see. But yeah, in general, in general, we do we do test to make sure that our type inference matches in like our known cases to the best of our ability. Um, there are situations where pandas does some weird things when it comes to type inference, and we, for example, like there might be somewhere where they return like an int sixty four, and we're like, hey, we can actually return like a smaller int than that and save you memory and make things faster, and we'll choose to do so. And so we can see here um, that basically. Uh, Let's see. Uh, that did not work. Okay. Either way, so if like we look in 64 objects, in 64 float, it basically does all the same type inference. Um, it's definitely faster if you specify data types because then it doesn't need to run extra logic in order to infer the types. Uh, but excuse me. Um, in general, we we do we do try our best to match the type inferencing capabilities and make sure that we're not having weird behaviors when it comes to types. So. Is this a cluster from NVIDIA that you're running? Uh, yeah, this is, this is a single box that I'm running on right now. And everything I showed here was single GPU right now. Yeah, this, this all ran on a single V100. Um, the next thing I was. What kind of GPU uh, A V100. Uh, I don't remember. It's the highest. It's like the current highest end GPU. I don't remember the exact price um, on it. I know it's thousands. I don't remember how many thousands. Um, what I will say is that the T4s that are, I think, in every cloud now are actually like amazing value for this type of work. The V100s have a lot of like deep learning accelerator hardware in it that just doesn't help with like this type of data science work. Uh, T4s, basically, as long as you're doing single precision and aren't doing double precision, are amazing because they have, I want to say, like 60% the memory bandwidth and compute of a V100. And so 60% of this type of performance is still really good for a lot less cost. Um, that there's a ton of value there. Um, so I am an NVIDIA employee. Having 95% of the data science pipeline on NVIDIA GPUs doesn't sound too bad to me. But um, on, like, the, the response I would give is that a lot, of people, a lot of people ask, like, why did you do this on top of CUDA instead of like, OpenCL or SysCL? And the, the answer to that is like, OpenCL, SysCL, they, they, like, they're open source, but everyone has their own proprietary implementation and extensions of it that basically makes it so no one can write the same OpenCL or SysCL to just generally target hardware. And you end up needing to like go through and rework everything depending on the hardware in order to like actually take advantage of the hardware nicely. Um, that in general, NVIDIA has put a ton of investment into the like CUDA software ecosystem. And for us, it just like, it absolutely doesn't make sense to not take full advantage of that investment. That, yeah, no, no, I, I mean, I get it. It's just kind of exactly what you said of like, oh, the entire pipeline can run on NVIDIA GPUs. That makes us smile and throw our thumbs up. Right. <laughs> so, but yeah, I mean, ultimately, like our goal is like, so like Rapids is this open source GPU accelerator community. We're really excited by it. We contribute to it. 
but our goal is that we just really think GPUs are a really good platform, uh, hardware platform to accelerate data science. And basically, we want, to, we want to embrace and extend that community. And that doesn't necessarily have to be through Rapids. That it could be, it could be something else that comes down the line that's just like objectively better than what's happening in Rapids right now. And that's great. We, just, we really believe that GPUs can really help accelerate these types of workloads and then allow people to kind of solve their problems more effectively by doing so. So. And I can say that kind of before joining NVIDIA, I spent a lot of time in the like Hadoop Spark ecosystem. And I was really, really tired of seeing like heap exception errors and like my driver dying because I ran out of heap memory. And so the fact that I'm like back in the Python ecosystem and like have like very strong control over things, it's a breath of fresh air from my perspective. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, so I, well, I'm not quite as in tune with QML, but I know that they were putting a ton of effort into making sure that you could essentially pickle to like serialize the models, similar like you would do with scikit-learn, and then be able to load those models, I believe, via, via scikit-learn or via QML in general, and like making sure that it's compatible to basically be able to interoperate with the other ML libraries in that way. Mm -hmm. There's, yeah, there's, there's, been, there's been talk of it. I think it's definitely in like the earlier, more exploratory stage. Um, there's definitely talks about how do we just like essentially spit out like the vectors of the weights and everything that can be used to like recreate the model, essentially. Uh, but I don't think that there's like a strong consensus on exactly what that should look like yet. Um, but that's definitely something that we were looking at and we're like looking in the community to see what other people are doing to try to figure out how we can like do it in like the best way to integrate with the community. So, that's really so. A big for us. yeah. Yep. Yep. No, no. Like, I, so I know for a fact that you can basically train on a machine and then export it and then use QML to infer on a different machine. And like, I know, be, I know that. I'm almost positive that you can like train on QML and then export to then like predict using Scikit-Learn. For example, I don't know. Um, I don't know if like further than that, if like there's a generalized like how do we export this model so that like anyone can go use it type thing. So, yeah. Uh, so just one other kind of quick fun demo. Uh, we I showed a benchmark earlier about SVD performance, and I figure we can just run it live and have some fun uh, and hope it doesn't break. Um, so what we're going to do first, basically, we're just going to we're going to do it on CPUs, and I'm only using 10 cores here on purpose because the basically Dask SVD ends up calling into the NumPy linear algebra library, which is already multi-threaded, I believe. And someone can correct me if I'm wrong. Okay, I am wrong. All I know is basically I've spent a lot of time tuning this, and the more cores I throw at it, the slower it goes in running QR decompositions. So, yes, please correct me. Okay. Gotcha. 
Well, no. So to be clear, this isn't Numba. This is whatever Dask's Dask Array Linear Algebra SVD implementation is, which eventually calls down to QR decompositions, which I assume just calls into NumPy somewhere. And yeah, yeah. So yeah, I'm almost positive this is OpenBloss, which I guess is then, I, I don't know. All I know is if I throw more cores at it, everything slows down right now. And so basically I found that like 10 was a general sweet spot. Otherwise everything just kind of hangs in the middle here. Um, so basically in running, basically you can see I just generate a little bit of random data. Actually, let me pull up my desk thing here. All right, so processing tasks, progress. All right, so we're using a, uh, we're using a Dask plugin here too that basically you can see here. So I've got, I've got, I generated a whole bunch of random data and basically what did I do? Um, so I've got a million rows and then I partitioned it. Uh, so I've got, a, sorry, a, a million by 1000 matrix and then I partitioned it into like 10,000 by 1,000 chunks. Um, and then running an SVD on it. So I basically, I contributed the lazy, the, I generated the task graph. Basically when I actually call persist, it will trigger the computation. And so you can see here, wow, this is, uh, let me change the theme here. Maybe make it a little bit easier to see. There we go. That's a little bit better at the cost being a little bit blinding. So you can see here, basically, it's doing a bunch of QR decompositions. Uh, that is not the one that I want to see, though. Processing tasks. Ah, there we go. Okay. So you can see we're doing we're doing a bunch of QR decompositions, but generally this this will end up taking a while. It'll take a few minutes to run. Um, but eventually I'll end up getting my result. I'm just going to, I'm going to stop this so we don't have to wait for it. Restart. All right. So now basically instead of just using a NumPy random state, which is essentially like just generating the random data, we are going to import CuPy. Uh, create a local CUDA cluster instead of a local cluster, and then use a CuPy random state. And then basically do the exact same code of calling the SVD and then persisting it. Refresh. And you can see that it finished. And let me run that one more time. All right, so I've got, I've got random data, basically call the SVD, and then doing it using CuPy instead of NumPy or Dask Array. And you can see basically the, the actual QR decomposition is just accelerated so much by the GPU um, that we can accelerate things quite a bit. And that, um, if I can blow this up for a second, it's not what I want to do. Um, so one thing that's really interesting here, uh, task stream kind of reset, basically at the end, like you can see all of this green here are like all the QR decompositions that are being run on the GPU. And then we have a whole bunch of these red chunks here at the end that are almost as long as the QR decomposition. And that's all of the communication happening. And I don't have UCX running on this machine. So this is actually running through TCP and you can see why hey, this communication actually takes as long as all of the compute here. And this is why we really needed to accelerate the communication under the hood for it. And so, all right. And so we're gonna do a little bit of Dask QDF stuff. Cool. And so kind of we talked about, we showed like using QDF, it looks and feels like pandas. Um, Similar to Dask Data Frame, we have Dask QDF. Um, and basically the idea of Dask QDF is where there's gaps between kind of QDF and pandas that we need to address for Dask. We have small helpers, but the idea of the library is to eventually just refactor itself out into unit tests. 
And that essentially will just completely rely on the mainline DAS code um, entirely and work with the DAS community to kind of make things friendlier for GPUs in a way that also just helps in general. And so here I'm basically, I just defined a simple function to generate some random data. Uh, so I'm using CuPy to generate some random data and essentially I'm generating 100 million rows uh, per task and then I'm running two tasks per worker here. And so basically you can see, um, okay, so I've got eight GPUs on this system. You can see, okay, each of them are using about five gigabytes of their memory. And then, okay, and you can see they're kind of going off, doing a whole bunch of compute. And I've got a Dask QDF data frame. And it looks and feels like a Dask data frame at this point, similar to how you would interact with CPUs. And you can see here, basically, I've got, I've got 1.6 billion rows that I'm working with in a data frame here. And then I can do kind of things that I would normally do, like, okay, call a group by and then get me the sum and mean of a column. And basically you'll see it just nicely uses all of the GPUs and then returns me my results. And I can kind of do other things that you're used to doing, like, hey, here's like a rolling window type calculation running, and there you go. Um, the, the, idea, the idea here being that Kind of you as an end user, you write the same high level pandas like code that you're used to writing. And we figure out how to take advantage of GPU hardware. We, uh, we handle basically scaling it for you that you just write the high level code and we figure out how to make everything work under the hood and how to accelerate everything under the hood for you. So I think that's all, that's all I really wanted to show as far as demo, presentation, whatnot. None of the demos broke, so thank you for praying to the demo gods. Um, at this point, I'll just take any other questions that people have. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's like, for example, for something where it's like, hey, you're trying to iterate over data on the GPU via Python will just blow up instead of letting you do that because that's like the absolute worst case of like triggering a mem copy per like byte, for example, which that would be, that would be really bad. Um, in general, yeah, in general, we try, to, we try to like guard against allowing you to do things that like real, that'll give you like a 10,000x slowdown accidentally. Um, and then as far as like profiling things go, what we've seen is that typically the most value we get out of like the typical Python profiling. So just using like, like C profile and then like especially there's a library called SnakeViz that's awesome. Um, that, gets us, that gets us a lot of the way there as far as like we can see, okay, this is an issue in the Python or all, all of our time is just in the C++ call at that point. And then so we get, like the, we get the quick view there. And if it's in the Python, great, we can, we, like, we can explore that profile and look at what we need to do. Or if it's in the C++, we go, okay, we know it's in the C++, we need to switch to a different profiling tool at that point. And at that point, um, there is a tool built into, or it's kind of shipped alongside the CUDA toolkit called uh, Nsight Compute, which replaces NVProf, that it allows you to profile both GPU and CPU code and like put ranges into the code and whatnot and shows like how you're utilizing your hardware and where time is being spent and whatnot. And so that's like the typical flow is we start with SnakeViz, see if it like glaringly shows anything. Um, if the C++ call is small, it's like great, we know it's in Python, let's just like dig into the profile and profile how you normally profile Python and explore. If, the C, if it's just like all in the C++, awesome, let's just move to the like more native profiling tool for that low level. Yep, Eric's talk, yeah. Yep. 
Yeah, so we've looked at it, we've looked at it from like a couple of perspectives, from like a pure performance perspective of like, hey, you want to run the exact same workflow, what does your like hardware footprint cost look like? Uh, we typically see like a 90 plus percent TCO reduction, really? even on cloud. Yeah, it's just, it, yeah, no, no, like, so yeah, like, like we, ha we have slides like that, but like that's not this, like, I just want, I want to like nerd out about tech here. So, um, but yeah, like tip it, like for, cl even with cloud, we see like 90 plus percent TCO reduction typically. Um, that I think uh, Mike McCarty is giving a talk at GTC DC, I think tomorrow about uh, Capital One's experience using Dask and Rapids. And I think he has some TCO related things in there. I definitely say to check it out. Um, but in general, uh, yeah, there's, there's a big TCO story um, from just a, you have this much, you're like paying for this many instances versus this many instances. And then if you're on-prem, that number just goes up higher, especially because there's a story about like, I can reduce my thousand plus node cluster to like 10 nodes in some situations. And like the amount of time, effort, and money that goes into like managing a cluster of that size versus managing 10 machines, that could be like a grad student at that point. So, so yeah. 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 Yeah, so TensorFlow is a struggle because TensorFlow kind of goes and does their own thing all over. With PyTorch, Chainer, MXNet, Paddle Paddle, um, everything is pretty straightforward and I can show you real quick. Yeah, that go back to this notebook, create a GDF data frame here. All right, so I've got my QDF data frame. I can call to DL pack on it. That returns me a Pi capsule of a DL tensor. I can immediately go hand this to essentially almost all of the deep learning frameworks and they can read that zero copy and immediate, immediately start training, inferencing whatever they want to do with it on it. And the same thing that essentially you do stuff there and then you want to hand it back. There is a QDF from DL pack that basically converts from a DL pack tensor to a QDF object. Very nice and tidy. Um, the other thing I would add is that basically if you have a column here, um, what you can do is basically there's something called the CUDA array interface, which I touched on earlier, which is basically just like a standard metadata description that basically describes what the data on the GPU looks like. So you can see it has the shape, the type string, um, a pointer to my data, and basically just like a version number that describes it. And a lot of libraries have started using this where like Numba, CuPy, PyTorch, uh, MPI for Py, and I think a couple others support this CUDA array interface as well. And that allows you to interop really easily. And it's, it's basically modeled after the NumPy array interface, but for GPUs. Yes? Yep. Not a data frame because each column is a separate memory allocation, but shoving a column, absolutely, and CUDA array interface will just, like, they'll say, oh, this object has CUDA array interface, I can implicitly just handle it. DL pack is explicit because it has um, different semantics where essentially the DL pack model is that if I export something to, D to DL pack and then that, that capsule gets used, the original memory is no longer valid. So th it has to be explicit there. Yeah. So for the data frame, um, your version of the data from this data frame, what percentage of the APA have you been able to do? And what's the roadmap going forward? Yeah, um, I, I don't have a good number as for what percentage of the API. It's like just because figuring out the full scope of the Pandas API is a little bit tricky. Um, I would say that in general, it's at the point now where we're not really getting we're not getting a ton of feature requests for like, you're missing this API, implement this API. Um, in general, like the majority of like things that people use on a day-to-day -day basis, 
we have the API for. I don't, I'm sure that we're missing keyword arguments in places and we like don't support using like a specific method under the hood that may be like, for example, doing like a forward fill, uh, fill in A, for example. Um, I'm sure there's like places like that that we don't support. In general, we, we haven't, our approach hasn't been like, here's the full total footprint of the Pandas API and every single permutation of that API. Our approach has been like, what do our users need to solve problems? Let's go build what they need to go solve their problems and basically rely on feedback from the community to drive what we should prioritize feature-wise. So then if you try to use something that is done by that just fails, so yep. it'll fall back to... It'll throw an exception. Uh, we, we, use, we use Pandas quite a bit internally, but like not for the actual computation side, for like the control flow, data type handling type stuff inside. Have you considered like falling back to the Pandas it, dependency? In general, no. Um, just because then if someone does something and then all of a sudden they slow down, it's not clear why. That like, if a user wants to do Pandas things, it's a one-liner to like go back to Pandas. Um, and that typically what we see is that, hey, if there's a gap there, because there's like somewhat easy to use UDFs that are performant, users can typically work around it pretty easily as well. And then in general, just we, we really want the feedback to say like, hey, we, we use this, could you implement this in QDF? The last thing we want is like someone to call something and then it's all of a sudden they're like, hey, this actually ran slower than Pandas. Maybe this QDF thing doesn't make sense. So. Is there any other questions? Cool. Well, thanks, everyone. Thank you for having me.